last talk uh, for the workshop. And this is uh, by Esther Cycle, and it's called Excitation Symmetry Systems. Um, Cybal obtained his PhD in physics in 2007 from Tulane University under the supervision of John Purdue. After postdocs at the University of California and University of California, Irvine, he is currently employed as a research scientist at Synthes Materials and Chemistry and holds a similar position at the Department of Chemistry, University of Oslo. His primary interests are in functional development and understanding of density function theory. Happy welcome, Esther. Uh, thanks, Bjorn, and um, thanks for uh, inviting me to the conference. I've picked up a lot. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so, uh, EET is something which has interested me for quite a while, uh, especially since my postdoc position uh, at UC Irvine, when we dabbled a little bit in the field. Uh, unfortunately, during my stay at Sintef thus far, we haven't had that much funding, some internal projects exploring a little bit. Uh, so, the actual computations that I, I will be speaking about uh, are things which I did at UCI uh, in California. Um, so I've structured uh, the talk so, uh, so that uh, in the first half I, I will cover mostly things that I do at the, at the UIO, uh, basically giving a guided tour of DFT, which is uh, maybe the most popular uh, computational tool uh, in the toolbox because of its good trade-off between uh, computational efficiency uh, and uh, well accuracy. And then in the second half I will touch a little bit on uh, things that I have done which at least borders to the field. <coughs> so Sintef is uh, maybe the lesser known of uh, the two institutions where I'm currently employed. Uh, so it's uh, in fact Scandinavia's largest independent research institute and Europe's fourth largest. Uh, it has 2,000 employees of which 73% are researchers and 55% of those again have PhDs. Uh, but and the vast majority of those are in this building and in other buildings here in Trondheim. Uh, NTNU, where, we're, where we currently are, uh, is very heavily co-entwined with, uh, with Sintef. Um, so, uh, in, in a sense, we, we, we live in a parallel universe since we have almost 2,000 here and 350 in Oslo. So, to us, Trondheim is actually the capital, while Oslo is the province within the Sintef system. Uh, Sintef spans a relatively large area of applied science. Uh, anything from uh, the oil sector to material science uh, to biological sciences, uh, uh, technology and society and so on and so on. Uh, within the field of quantum modeling, be it uh, solid state physics or quantum chemistry, we are, uh, according to my head count, maybe 13 scientists working currently. Um, also, uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, postdoc supervisor, uh, with whom I did the computations that uh, uh, that will be towards the second half of the talk. So uh, I'll start very general. So basically, in in typical uh, quantum chemistry and quantum solid state physics computations. Uh, we live in uh, within uh, the framework of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and I uh, I will apologize for uh, the number of equations. Uh, the main thing is is though there, there is a Hamiltonian go governing a molecular system uh, containing both the electronic kinetic energy, the nuclear kinetic energy operator, 
and the interaction between, so the Coulomb interaction between uh, all of the nu nuclei and the electrons. So by separating the wave function into an electronic part, which uh, depends both on the nuclear coordinates and the electron coordinates, and uh, uh, a nuclear part uh, which depends only on the nuclear coordinates, uh, and by assuming that this term, which uh, which basically contains the the dependence of the uh, electron wave function uh, on the nuclear coordinates, so the derivatives with respect to the nuclear coordinates, if you assume this term is small, uh, then the equation separates, and you get a separate. Uh, um, electron Schrodinger equation, which is the one that we usually look at uh, in our computations, and uh, and the nuclear uh, wave function, which typically will uh, give rise to say vibrational uh, spectra and, uh, and and that sort of stuff. Uh, the main thing here is basically if you you, you can run an MD where you I, 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 to a very good approximation, can uh, treat nuclei as classical particles moving on a potential energy surface. The potential energy surface is only this here, E, uh, as a function of the nuclear coordinates. That's, uh, th 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 that's the eigenvalues of the Schr Schrodinger equation uh, as a function of the nuclear coordinates uh, in the electronic Schrodinger equa e e equation. So basically, you can view the nuclei as moving at this very high dimensional surface uh, as classical particles. And the only cases where they actually jump uh, from one state to the other is either if they get excited by uh, an electromagnetic uh, field, uh, or if uh, this approximation doesn't hold so, for instance, if uh, like two points here where they get very close, then in many cases uh, this, these derivatives will no longer be small. And then you, you can uh, get what is known as surface hopping uh, between the two, uh, the, the, the two surfaces. Uh, I will come back to that towards the end of, uh, of the talk. So density functional theory is in many ways the workhorse of uh, most of what, what is going on within computational uh, solid states and uh, quantum chemistry. And uh, so, so, so basically, if you assume that, uh, that, that psi is the actual ground state wave function of the system, uh, and keep in mind, DFT is only dealing with ground state wave functions, really. Uh, then there is something known as the Hohenberg-Cohn theorem, which says that, in, in essence, it says if you know uh, the density of the system, the electron density as a cloud, uh, then you know the Hamiltonian. And then, in principle, you can, you, you can write uh, the ground state energy as a function of the density. In practice, however, what, uh, what you do in the DFT computation is that you, you use a model wave function, uh, which is sort of like uh, a, uh, so, 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 so it's sort of like a Hartree-Fock wave function, a single determinant wave function, which is restricted to having uh, the same density as the actual wave function of the system, the interacting wave function. Um, and, uh, and what you end up with is, so, so you have this uh, model system of non-interacting particles. It has no physical uh, meaning except for having the right density. And, uh, 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 and the, these orbitals that make up this single determinant wave function, uh, the, 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 they can be found by a, a simple common, a, a solutions of a simple common Schrodinger equation. So the, the DFT energy expression has, it, 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 it sort of follows 
um, the thinking of um, computing the gr grouping things into large terms that you can compute exactly and then trying to approximate the small bits. So uh, this, for instance, is the, what is known as the, the non-interacting kinetic energy, which is sort of the kinetic energy of, well, loosely speaking, uh, uh, the, uh, of, of a Hartree-Fock uh, wave function at, uh, at this density. Uh, and then uh, this is the attraction between the nuclei and the cloud of electrons, which you can also easily compute exactly. And then you have this, uh, which is known as the Hartree term, that's only the classical repulsion between two electron clouds of density rho of r. Uh, and that's also easily computable. So, and, and these three terms here, those are the big elephants. And then you have the difficult stuff where all the quantum things uh, reside. Uh, and those are approximated. Uh, they are known as the exchange correlation uh, energy. Yeah, I miss a minus here, but this is then the, uh, the exchange energy. Uh, that, that is also exactly known if you, if you know the orbitals uh, from your cone chum, um, no, no, from your cone chum system. Uh, so in principle, if you if you use this expression for exchange, you're actually down to uh, to, to to only having to approximate uh, electron correlation, and this is an order of magnitude less than this, and this is significantly less than these. So you end up with having to approximate, at least in principle, a very small part of the uh, 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 of the energy. So, uh, and, uh, so, so what is correlation? So the, these are graphs that I, uh, I took from a FISREV B article by Paolo Gore Giorgi and co-workers. Um, so so this, is, uh, th this is a model for uh, electron correlation in what is known as a uniform electron gas which is basically you assume that you have a constant background and then you load onto that uh, uh, the, the same uh, density of electrons as the background. Uh, and then, uh, and, uh, and basically that, 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 that is viewed as a gas which has many of the same correlation effects. So basically what happens is, so if you, so, so, so sort of if, if the electrons have been uncorrelated, they would simply be flowing past each other. And that, that, that's what happens in the non-interacting system. Uh, what correlation does, it, it, it takes sort of the, the part of the probability of finding the electrons close to each other and throws it further out. Because if you, uh, the, if you, if you can reduce the probability of finding the electrons close to each other, you reduce the electron-electron repulsion. And, um, uh, so, uh, and, uh, and in that way, you reduce this term uh, significantly uh, at the cost of increasing uh, the uh, average kinetic energy, but not by as much as you decrease uh, the electron, uh, uh, the average electron, electron repulsion energy. Uh, as one can see, the, the, the correlation behavior between uh, equal spin electrons and opposite spin electrons is also uh, qualitatively different. In the uncorrelated case, uh, two opposite spin electrons would just fly by each other and they, they would have an equal probability of being, being found close to each other as far away from each other. Um, and the, while the, in, in the equal spin case, the uh, electrons uh, uh, ha have to obey the Fermi exclusion principle, which is already in the, included in the exchange term. And that means that the chance of finding them at the same position anyhow is zero. Um, which also means that during the additional correlation treatment after having included uh, Fermi exchange, 
the, the amount and nature of correlation is also different. One also sees that the, the depth of the well of an electron density that you're taking from close to another electron and throwing far away from that electron um, is also uh, very, differ very different for uh, the high density regime which is up here and the low density regime which is down here. So um, DFT has a lot of cases where it works and a lot of cases where it doesn't. Uh, as is often said by, uh, the, 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 by great people in DFT, it's, uh, DFT is great because uh, it works in, in cases where you don't expect it to work. But uh, likewise, it fails in cases where you don't expect it to fail. Um, uh, however, a, a few cases are known. Uh, static correlation, that, that, that's sort of the, the case you have when you have a very small gap between the lowest unoccupied and highest occupied molecular orbitals. Uh, that, that, that's a case where DFT generally doesn't work. Um, and uh, and that, that has to do with, uh, you, you can almost see the reason uh, simply by, by, by looking at any mo model system. Uh, in, in a sense what correlation effects do is that they take, uh, at, at least if you, if you look at the uh, Colosalvetti construction, uh, which underlies the LYP uh, correlation functional, which is often used like in B3LIP. Um, you, you sort of start with uh, a single determinant wave function, and then you do a correlation treatment of changing that wave function on average a little bit. Uh, however, if, if the orbitals that are occupied and not occupied are qualitatively, well, are, are very close to each other, then you can assume that, uh, that, that, that this starting uh, wave function that you're going to, to slightly change uh, may be quite far away from uh, the actual wave function where you should have started, simply because where you should have started should have been some sort of uh, interpolation be, be, between these two wave functions, uh, so some sort of, uh, of sum of the two. Uh, also, uh, von der Waals interactions cannot be modeled by usual DFT functionals. Well, when, when people run uh, DFT computations we're using the, the ordinary toolbox of, the, of DFT and, and, and they want to find a von der Waals interaction, what they typically find is basis set superposition errors. Uh, and you, you can so, sort of see that from here also. Um, uh, it's uh, so, so, so sort of what, what is modeled is in many cases the short range correlation between two electrons, whereas uh, the tail uh, is very difficult to model because it varies so much between the, the different systems. Uh, there is also a significant cancellation of error baked into these functionals that you typically use. For instance, in the uniform electron gas, uh, the, the correlation hole has, uh, has this 1 over r to the fourth decay, which is, uh, the, which is canceled by a corresponding decay in the exchange. Uh, so so you, you can't, uh, no, while, in, uh, while, in, uh, so while in nature, uh, the, the, the slowest decay is 1 over r to the fifth. If you, if you use one for only the correlation functional and not the exchange functional, for instance, uh, for n the, 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 then you will get some sort of spurious 1 over r to the fourth dependence uh, in this uh, correlation function. Um, so uh, uh, another thing is uh, one is often uh, assuming that, uh, that that one would get uh, the difference. Uh, so, so sort of an analogy to the Copeland theorem that uh, if you take the difference between the highest unoccupied and uh, the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied orbitals, that that would be a good estimation of 
uh, of the difference between the ionization energy and uh, electron affinity. That is not the case uh, b because of a highly theoretical thing, but very real thing known as uh, the VXC discontinuity. Uh, and this delta VXC is generally completely unknown. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the, the conclusion is if, if you're so lucky to get a fundamental band gap uh, doing a solid state computation, for instance, uh, by simply taking the difference between E Lumo and E Homo, uh, your functional is wrong. It's not that the computation is great. Um, <coughs> TDDFT, time dependent DFT, is sort of a further development of DFT. Uh, it's, it's based on the Runge-Gross theorem, uh, which uh, so still says that uh, there is a one-to-one a -one correspondence between uh, the, the density and its time development and the Hamiltonian or external potential. So just like in ordinary DFT, if you, if you know the density, you know the system. So you can do much of the same thing. You, you still have the same kind of whole, uh, no, cone chum wave function. You, you still have a sort of time dependent, in this case, cone chum equation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and then as Perulov uh, po pointed out, uh, basically what you can do is you can simulate that you're subjecting uh, the system to a, a time varying e electromagnetic field with a frequency omega. Uh, and wh whenever you find a pole in uh, the linear response, uh, response function, uh, that, that is where you have an uh, excitation energy. And in many cases, what is done is that w one does this not by a time simulation, but by changing this uh, through a Fourier transform into a linear equation. One does this uh, using the ordinary toolbox of uh, ground state density functionals. And typically it works quite well. Um, however, uh, TDDFT also has its pitfalls. Uh, so, uh, for instance, charge transfer excitations. So if you have two molecules and the excitation consists of moving one electron from this molecule to the other. Uh, those will be predicted to have uh, to, to have excitation energy E Lumo minus E Homo. However, as we just spoke about, uh, that that is uh, the the, the uh, that 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 is uh, not the same as uh, the electron. Uh, the, the, the ionization potential minus the electron affinity, which is the actual result that you're after because of the VXC discontinuity. Uh, another uh, pitfall in uh, TDDFT is that uh, typically what you're doing is linear response, which means that if, if your excitation has a large amount of doubles excitations in it, so if, if, so if, if you look at your cone sham wave functions and the, excita the excitation consists of exciting two electrons instead of one, uh, that's not uh, within the, the scheme of linear response, so you need quadratic response. For instance, we did some unsuccessful computations on linear polyenes. Uh, and uh, and that, that, that was surprising uh, until I read an article where the author claimed that uh, some longer linear polyenes had 80% doubles uh, in the excitation we were after. Uh, so now to, to, to some computations that I did uh, at UC Irvine. Um, so we, 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 we looked at something known as the, the two-pyridone dimer, that's this one. Uh, it is viewed as a model for a TA uh, DNA base pair. And part of the reason why people are interested in this is exactly for, for the reason of excitation energy transfer. 
uh, as I understand, uh, the theory is that uh, if UV radiation hits the DNA molecule, then, uh, th then that can cause radiation damage, and EET between these strands is, uh, uh, is relevant uh, in that regard. So, um, basically, the, uh, <coughs> so the, 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 the two peridone dimer has this structure. If you, if, if, if you view the lowest two singlet excitations as being linear combinations of the case where A is excited and B is unexcited, and B and then the, and A is unexcited and B is excited, then you get so get two states. Uh, well, one is uh, uh, the, the, one has anti-parallel um, transition dipole moments, and the other is parallel, meaning that this one is going to uh, absorb and emit uh, uh, radiation very actively whereas this one is going to be practically dark, uh, the, the, the transition from the ground state up to this state. And uh, the reason, so, so, so basically what, what people have been interested in is the splitting, the energetic splitting between uh, the S1 and S2 states. And the reason is that the size of the splitting uh, gives uh, the size of the interaction between the transition densities, which is exactly the coupling element that one is also using when, uh, wh when computing the excitation energy transfer rate uh, between the two electrons. Um, so, uh, the, there was this group which, uh, uh, which did a spectroscopical measurement and uh, b based on their theory, uh, the S1 state would then due to symmetry be dark, the S2, the, the transition into S2 would be bright. And the, they theorized that if they, if they deuterated one of these two hydrogens here and not the other, uh, then that would create a small asymmetry in the molecule and, uh, uh, and, and then the S1 state would show up to a certain extent. Uh, and that's also sort of what they got. Uh, they, they got this small additional peak uh, in the mono deuterated case. And then they simply said, okay, this peak is obviously the S2 since it shows up also in the case where the molecule is undeuterated. Uh, and they simply measured the distance between these two peaks. Uh, uh, to be about uh, 50 inverse centimeters, and said, "Okay, this is uh, the, the, this is twice the, uh, the, the this uh, interaction term. So this is the splitting between the S1 and S2." However, we also did computations on this, and uh, uh, and found uh, quite different results. I, in fact, the computed splitting between the relaxed S1 state and S2 state uh, in our computations was no less than 3,200 inverse centimeters. And this was computed at, uh, at CC2 level uh, using TDDFT geometries. Compared to, to an experimental uh, value of 50, that's quite ast astounding. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so then we, we started asking ourselves why. I mean, is, is the theory completely off? This is, after all, CC2. Uh, or the, does this peak that they have here, is it really something completely different? And uh, so, so, so what we observed was that in our S1 state, in fact, the symmetry disappears uh, be because the excitation localizes on only one uh, of the two monomers. 
And uh, in addition, one of the hydrogen bonds becomes longer than the other. And uh, that is quite relevant because uh, if, you, if you now populate one, uh, one bond with a deuterium instead of a hydrogen, uh, instead of, uh, the, or if you populate the other with deuterium, then that is going to create a different vibrational energy. So if you look at the difference in zero point vibrational energy at the S1 potential energy surface, between the case where this one has deuterium and this one has a deuterium, the difference is 33 uh, inverse centimeters, which is quite close to 50. So what we're su suggesting is, in fact, that, um, that, that, it's, uh, that, that both of these peaks that they found are, the, uh, uh, are actually S1 states. Uh, and uh, that these are two different signals uh, from uh, two different uh, uh, n n f from two different minima uh, on the surface, having the theorem on the long bond and the short bond. Uh, then uh, I promised to to also say something about excitation energy transfer, and I have this very last slide uh, on that. So if one thinks back to, uh, to what I said about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, uh, basically, uh, if, if, if this is, uh, say, uh, the nuclear coordinates, the nuclear positions, then uh, the, the, the nuclei can be viewed as following uh, the potential energy surface of uh, the uh, the, uh, of, of the electronic state that, the, that they are in. And generally, as long as this term here is small, then it will just sort of follow the surface along. Um, however, uh, if, if you look at cases such as, a, a, as, a, as in 2 Peridon, uh, where you have uh, one part of the structure region uh, where the, 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 where the energy is lowest uh, if uh, monomer A is excited and not monomer B, and another part of, uh, of, of space corresponding to having B in its relaxed uh, excited structure and A in its relaxed ground state uh, structure. Um, then the 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 the, the lowest uh, state, or the, the this uh, uh, the, this potential energy surface, w will sort of change electronic character from uh, a case where B is excited to a case where A is excited. And as long as this gap here uh, is relatively large, so that this element here is, um, is relatively small, uh, then in fact what you're getting is, uh, is an EET, uh, which, uh, w w which basically behaves like a transition state theory. Uh, that, that all you need to do is to push your system above, uh, above this barrier, and then it falls down into uh, the case where the excitation has been transferred from B to A. Uh, whereas if, if, if the coupling element uh, between the molecules is very small and uh, this gap is correspondingly very small, uh, then the change in the wave function becomes very abrupt. These derivatives become, become very large and there is a big chance that the system will actually jump over to the surface and follow it up here, and then sort of relax the, down the same uh, the, the the same way. So the, so this is a way to in, in 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 this way excitation energy transfer can be viewed uh, simply as a transition state theory coupled with uh, a surface hopping mechanism, with the surface hopping uh, being dictated by 
uh, by the coupling term. So uh, then I want to thank you all for your attention and hope that you were able to at least follow parts of it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, is the take-home message that organic chemists like myself should steer clear of doing our own DFT? Could we get into more trouble than it's worth? Or do you think there is some value in, in, in amateur efforts? No, I, I, I think there is value in it. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, the, the DFT, like any quantum chemistry, has its own wormholes and yeah, problems. Um, uh, I mean, so, so certainly you, you see lots of DFT done incorrectly. Uh, so one has to be aware of sort of the, the, the pitfalls. I have a quick question before uh, I still remember. Uh, in that graph, the lambda, is that wavelength? Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, I, I should have. Yeah, I, I should maybe have spent more time introducing this. This is a nuclear coordinate, a reaction core, a reaction coordinate between the structure where molecule A is sort of in in a geometry which is quite close to the ground state geometry of the monomer, and B is in a structure which is quite close to the excited state structure. And then if you, if you just view this as a reaction coordinate between that and the opposite, then you can view EET as sort of a transition state theory between the two. Um, you said that uh, if the homo lumo gap is minimal, yes. then the DFT predicted, um, DFT predicted uh, excitation energies are not reliable. Can um, uh, maybe not so much the excitation energies, but uh, but the, the ground uh, uh, yeah the, the the ground state computations may also be problematic because in in many cases uh, if you for instance you have a molecule with a small homo luma gap uh, then the the chances may be big that uh, that that you have big so, so called static correlation effects so that the, the the best starting point wave function before you make a correlation treatment is really a linear combination of those two almost degenerate wave functions okay. so so i have a following question um so if if i were to have a uh more accurate estimate of um, the energy or excite uh, the energy of the molecular system or also uh, for that matter excitation energies uh, do you think that we will have to sort of have a very customized functional dft functional for each molecular system or because mm -hmm. for example b b3 mm -hmm. lib all the mm -hmm. standard ones mm -hmm. you will never find one functional fitting for all kinds of molecule uh, uh. and uh, given the, you also said that if the homolumo gap is minimal, it just goes off the track completely. Yeah. Um, so do you think that we will have to sort of have a, a unique functional for each molecular system we are studying? Or no, I, 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 I hope not. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, this is the area where re religion enters into DFT, sort of. Because you, you have different directions in, uh, in, in the field of DFT. You have certain functionals which are very semi-empirical and fitted to sort of fit various f physical chemical regimes. And then you have others which sort of just stick to uh, a, cu a couple, no, stick to basic physics, uh, make starting points that are well uh, sort of controlled. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, and even when they are taken outside of their comfort regime, they still contain lots of good physics. Uh, I may be a bit, uh, may be a bit biased because uh, my PhD supervisor uh, is uh, is belonging to to that la latter the direction of simply starting with a uniform electron gas, which contains lots of correct correlation. Correct, uh, correct exchange, and then, uh, and, and then just taking that outwards, um, to to using better and better corrections based on that. 
I, I think the, the main problem of using very empirical functionals uh, is once you get outside of the area where it is fitted, do you really know what kind of results you're getting? Uh, and, and also there, there is a question, I mean, if you, if you have a functional which is even generally good for chemistry, but not for solid state physics, how do you want to compute, say, for instance, a molecule sitting on a solid state surface? So, uh, so, so I, I really hope, at least, that, that going forward, density functionals would sort of build on general, uh, general physical fundamental principles, but just incorporate more and more of them, more and more accurately. Uh, so that they can cover a larger uh, area of physics and chemistry in a reliable way and, and always keep sort of fundamental physics uh, uh, in the bottom. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, uh, we thank uh, Espen and all the other speakers in this session. Okay, and